All right. Awesome. Um, so appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Lenny Pisano. I'm the director of capital markets and investor relations. I came on board with Avid Realty Partners about six months ago. I've been in real estate for the past couple of years, and, and I'm excited for the opportunity to be on this platform, continuing to serve our investors and, and continuing to learn. Um, so we're going to dive into a few different topics. We'll, we're we're going to be touching on inflation, um, Fed talk, and, and just you know our perspective on the markets moving forward and, and some of the stuff that we're seeing currently as well. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it over to Craig. Um, I'll let him go into his background, some updates on the team, and, and then we'll get started. Awesome. Lenny, thank you so much. Um, our agenda today, we're going to very quickly just look at the firm and where we're at, introduce a few um, team members or, or announce a few team members that we've recently hired, um, and then sort of discuss inflation and the economy and, and where we think real estate and particularly multifamily is going in 2023. Um, so this is probably going to last a while. I think we're going to go back and chop it up and distribute it in various smaller digestible pieces. If you need to drop off by any means, do that. If you want to hang out and stay on, um, then, then do that as well. So let me, um, you know, again, thanks for joining. Excited to have you. Let me give you a little bit about the firm. Am I screen sharing right now? All right, so share screen. Um, we're Avid Realty Partners. You know, any investor does have meaningful challenges in deploying their capital into opportunities that are the best risk reward um, in, into investments and sponsors that provide you transparency and align interests and and you know, to work with people that are truly looking out for your best interest. Um, we're, we're glad to be people of integrity and we do work tirelessly for our investors. Um, just a few key stats. We've acquired 275 million of real estate across more than a dozen um, projects since we were founded in um, around the beginning of 2015, we've acquired about 2,000 multifamily units. We've taken roughly 80 million of product full cycle. Um, here's our two most recent multifamily um, dispositions. These are gross IRRs. Uh, and we do have a 34% equity weighted average IRR across the six deals that we've taken full cycle. We're proud of that. Um, Here's a picture of the deal we just acquired a month ago. Terraces of Perkins Row in Baton, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Beautiful asset. Excited to start working on that deal, improving it, upgrading our residents' quality of life. Here's where we are. Some current deals and sold deals. Um, I'm not going to walk you through all of our investment strategies, but in short, it's by deals we think will deliver strong risk-adjusted returns, grow a diversified footprint of assets from a geographic, demographic, age, and price per unit perspective. We are focused on Sunbelt and population growth, job growth markets. Here's one of our deals in Houston, Texas, OXO at Memorial. We rebranded that deal. Um, so this is the current team. And James, Mary, and Jim are all recent hires, super talented and qualified people, and really excited to have them on the team. Um, so James uh, was recently president at Nelson Partners which is a student housing and multifamily platform with roughly 15,000 units in the portfolio. He's also spent time at PEG, as well as GE Capital, KeyBank Private Equity, and others. We recently hired Mary Tucker as our chief financial officer, 
She spent the last 17 years as CFO at KBK Development, which is a uh, light tech platform that does development as well as buy existing assets. Super excited to have her expertise on the team. And we've hired Jim McCarthy. Jim spent 25 years in operations at Enterprise, which is a Fortune 500 company, um, and has spent three years subsequent to that at a multi multi-family platform um, working on operations and capital markets. Uh, Luis is running our acquisitions effort and has been with the with the company for two and a half years already. How time flies. Thanks, Luis. Jeff Feldman works on operations and asset management with a, with a particular focus on our St. Louis assets. Um, Omar helps with underwriting and uh, a variety of administrative and um, uh, ownership related tasks. And Lenny is crushing it on the capital market side. So that's a little bit about the team. There's eight of us full time at this point. And we have hired in advance of what we expect will be somewhat meaningful growth in 2023, while we view um, the market as presenting a great buying opportunity. Um, here's our Dallas deal, the Pearl of Midtown. Here's some investor testimonials, other testimonials. Here's some of the projects we've sold with IRRs and equity multiples. I'm not going to go through everything. Here's some of the deals we own. Here's our deal, Pines at Wood Creek. And that's just a little bit about the firm. We're actually in the in the process of, of turning this into a slightly affordable housing deal and lowering our tax burden significantly. Excited about that. Um, so that's a little bit about us, Lenny, what do we want to do from here? Um, so we can dive into the questions or you want to give a little bit of background on yourself for those of you that might not. Let's, let's get into questions. Okay, let's do it. Um, so to start off, we'll dive into some of the topics in, in relation to inflation, the fed, and just some, some general stuff about the economy. So the first one here we have is what's happening in the overall economy right now. And how is inflation playing into that? Right. The overall economy, um, I'd call it steady, stable, perhaps with a slight downward trend. Um, and really what's happened is we all had, you know, experience and lived through a global pandemic, COVID, things shut down, right? The Fed um, really tried to juice the markets and provide liquidity and provide money to people that were out of work. So we had a little bit of a um, a party, a free money, cheap money party. The federal government participated in that as well by sending out multiple rounds of stimulus checks, PPP money, a lot of free money. Um, and now what we're dealing with in 2022 is a little bit of a hangover. Anytime you have that big of a party and go above trend for so long, you're going to have to go below trend and pay the piper. And so that's kind of what we're dealing with in 22. And I think we'll see more of it in 23. Um, you know, the Fed basically kept rates too low for too long, too much accommodation, too much easy money, free money. And it really, you know, created a, a, a price bubble across equities, real estate, crypto, um, every asset class. And so, you know, it did spur inflation. They're now trying to squelch inflation. And one of the ways they're doing that is, of course, by raising rates meaningfully um, and, and trying to um, get, the, get the situation back under control. So I don't see a crash, at least not yet. It could be a soft landing, um, but we're definitely in the process of... Um, cooling off from an overheated, easy money time around COVID. Interesting. Um, so the next question that we have here is, what are the causes of inflation and how much is due to supply chain, Russia, Ukraine, and other factors? 
and what are these other factors? Right. Um, you know, you watch the news and it's, oh, Russia, Ukraine, or it's, or it's supply chain. To me, those aren't really the causes of inflation. Those are the excuses um, that people talk about for inflation. But here's the fact. The Fed grew M2 money supply by 40% from February of 2020 through the end of 2021. 40% growth in total dollars out there in 21 months. When you grow dollars 40%, you're going to get 40% inflation. And that's pretty much what we got. I know people say 7% and 8%. Anybody that goes out shopping or dining um, or tried to buy a house in 2021 knows that inflation since pre-COVID was a lot more than 7 or 8%. It was more like 30 to 40%. Um, and so the Fed really did us a disservice by keeping this free money, quantitative easing, um, growth in M2 money supply going for too long. The other factor, of course, as I slightly alluded to, is the federal government who passed stimulus after stimulus after stimulus and, and PPP money and um, businesses claiming tons of tons of money, even businesses that didn't need it. Um, wealthy people um, getting multiple rounds of stimulus, people on social security getting multiple rounds of stimulus. Um, and so it was not a targeted approach. It was a blanket free money giveaway that also contributed um, to inflation um, by the federal government. And then yes, much, much further down the list and with a much, much smaller impact with supply chain issues as a result of shutdowns or you know around the world and then you know finally russia ukraine i think did impact energy prices a bit you know has impacted wheat prices a bit maybe some agricultural products um, but it's really minuscule impact in my opinion relative to you know quantitative easing and the federal government free money handouts so to follow up on that you mentioned okay you know there's difference in you know where we kind of think inflation is at so what is the real inflation rate as compared to official rates reported i mean you know everybody has their own opinion i personally think the federal government data is slightly cooked you know i i think prices are up 30 to 40 percent from pre-covid levels and you know, that's kind of where I'm at on it, but but differing different people have differing opinions. And and so to kind of go back to what you mentioned before in your 2023 outlook, it mentions the so-called Frankenstein experiment known as QE. Can you explain that in a little bit more detail, starting off with what does quantitative easing mean? So quantitative easing is a process whereby the Federal Reserve buys bonds, corporate bonds, treasuries, agency bonds, um, a variety of a variety of different debt instruments. And when I say they buy um, buy bonds, what that means is, you know, a Goldman Sachs or a Citigroup um, basically gives the Fed an IOU note here, IOU, a hundred billion dollars. And the Fed wires $100 billion to Citigroup at 0% interest, and that money didn't exist previously, you know, even 30 seconds before. So that's how the Fed has taken their Fed balance sheet from $4 trillion to $10 or $11 trillion. That's a lot of increase in M2 money supplies, and it's far more aggressive than the Fed ever was before. In fact, if you go back to 2007, 2008, before um, the Great Recession, the Fed's balance sheet was less than a trillion dollars. It was eight or 900 billion. And then the Great Recession came or the Great Financial Crisis came in 2008, 2009. And they, they did pursue quanti quantitative easing and took their balance sheet up to roughly 4 trillion and then started taking it down again. And then once COVID hit, it was just a, a stratospheric increase in dollars. So um, they really did way too much QE. 
um, in combination with keeping interest rates too low for too long. Um, you know, even, you know, I'm not an economist, but even, even I in, in early 21 um, and, and mid 21 was like, all right, time to take interest rates up and, you know, end the QE and let's get back to um, a more normal environment because the world was by and large open again. Um, but they didn't, and they telegraphed it all the way until, uh, you know, whatever it was, the end of end of 21, they were telegraphing, you know, end of QE and, and rising rates in early 22. Um, and that was just, you know, in my opinion, at least a year too long. Yeah, and, and I think that kind of funnels into the next question. You know, the Fed is definitely at this point trying to save face. Um, you know, they were late to start raising rates from COVID driven lows. Um, so can you explain how the Fed was late and, and what are some of the specific actions that need to, that are need, that need to be taken um, to correct the current inflation? Well, they're, they're definitely doing it and they are working to save face. So, um, you know, they're raising the federal funds rate. They're sucking liquidity out of the system by doing reverse QE or quantitative tightening, QT. Um, uh, importantly, they're talking a big game because, you know, there is this expectations setting impact on inflation. If people expect inflation to keep going, it will keep going. And so they do want to get ahead of that and say, hey, we're serious about fighting this. Um, they're doing what they need to do. But, you know, again, they are they are late and they are working to save face. It would have been a lot better for all involved, especially working class blue collar people that don't own assets if the Fed wouldn't have let things run so far for so long. So now they're trying to make up for it via, you know, higher higher federal funds rate, sucking liquidity out of the system via quantitative tightening, um, talking a big game so that people's expectations can get squashed down. Um, and, you know, they are trying to uh, basically squelch employment, right? They think employment is overheated. And that's one of the one of the main factors that that comprise inflation wages, and they're trying to squelch that. So they're doing the right things at this point. Um, um, and we'll see how long they, they keep it going. I mean, I do think it's a little interesting to note that the markets are, are you know, the 10 year treasury forward curve is not totally in sync with what the Fed is saying. And there's a disconnect. The market's saying that they don't totally believe the Fed's big, big talk and big game. But, you know, um, we'll see how that plays out. And so you mentioned QT. Um, I kind of want to open that up a little bit. Contrary to QE, what is QT specifically, you know, and how does this process work? And what are some of the impacts on the money supply and inflation throughout this process? Well, the, the Fed bought all of these um, debt instruments, agency agency bonds, others, and they're basically, they want to shrink their balance sheet. So I think they're, um, you know, shrinking one class of, of holdings, agency bonds by 60 billion a month, or they're shrinking something else by 45 billion a month. Um, so that's good. I'm not sure if I have my exact numbers right. I didn't, you know, I'm not, a, a again, an economist or a Fed expert, but um, they are shrinking their holdings by about 100 billion a month, but they do own, you know, 10 or 11 trillion on, on the balance sheet at this point. If they were to go, you know, if they were to shrink 7 billion, that would take about 70 months or roughly six years for that process to play out. Um, and basically they're sucking liquidity out of the system. All of those, all of those IOUs that they, that they hold from Citigroup or Goldman Sachs or, or um, Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, they're basically um, saying, here's your note back, uh, um, you know, give me the money back and they're sucking those dollars out of the system so they're working to shrink m2 money supply because frankly that is 70 percent of the cause of inflation give or take um, and they need those dollars back you know there's a certain point at which the tools that the fed engaged won't work the next time if if there's too you know if if the balance sheet is too big the, the next time a recession comes um, you know, that tool will have more limited impact. So we need to get back down to a, a more normalized Fed balance sheet via quantitative tightening. 
Um, and you know, maybe even the federal government can can rein in spending or 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 hold the line on spending. And um, you know, if there's no growth in, in government spending, that is de facto shrinkage in in light of ongoing inflation. So um, you know, maybe with Republican controlled House, though they will be able to hold the line on on government spending. I'm not holding my breath, but but you know, potentially. Yeah. And and in your report, I mean, you had some some interesting breakdowns, you know, line by line. Um, so what are you seeing in the various line items of inflation now? And and can you give a line by line explanation about the data driven? It, you know, there was a green chart and a red chart. Um, so if we can dive into that a little bit. Perfect. Um, you guys can see my screen. It's just really an internal file. I've got a few notes off to the side. Um, but we do have historical trends here for some of the major um, in, indices, PPI, producer price index, consumer price index, you know, CPI, less food and energy, wages, right, energy, you know, metals, metals and, and materials, food and farm products, just a few of the things that I like to keep keep tabs on. And basically we're looking at you know, what, what did these things do in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022 year to date? Um, you know, but what has it also been if you take the last three or four months and annualize those? And I think what it suggests is that by and large, um, we've beat inflation. I'm, I'm waving, I'm waving, you know, I'm, I'm declaring victory. Um, you know, headline PPI is averaged 1.2% um, over the last four months. That's an annualized average. Um, you know, let's let's take a look at it. You know, here's basically the last the last four months. You've got you know an average of 0.1. If you had 12.1 readings in a row, you'd be up. 1.2 percent year over year after the 12th month and that's what these last four months are annualized at so you know ppi looks really good cpi also looks really good um you know what is not good is wages wages are still growing five six seven percent even on an on a annualized basis and look, that makes sense. Um, you know, even even I'm getting ready for 2023 with my employees, and I'm saying, "Wow, prices went up a lot last year. Let me give my people a, you know, five, six, seven, eight percent raise so they can live." There's some emotional component to to wages and salaries. There's some delayed impact with you know with with some folks getting annual raises in January. Um, and you know that's one area that's still strong. I mean, the economy is still reasonably robust despite the the Fed's efforts to squelch it. Um, and you know, wages is one area that's that's still sticky, right? You know, diesel is also not great, but you know, petro has has come down a lot over the last few months. We'll see if that can hold or if it's temporary. You know, um, raw materials are shrinking a lot. You know, food is mixed. Well, I'd call I'd call half a percent green. Food is mixed, but um, you know we're we're basically more or less in pretty good shape on most of these line items outside of wages, and wages isn't crazy. So I think after another two, three, four, five readings, what we're going to see is. Um, you know, that inflation is is more or less beat. You know, another thing we tend to look at, and it's not in the spreadsheet, but shipping container volume coming from um, overseas, especially China, into the United States is way down. In fact, it's at like COVID lows. And that's because of inventory. Um, inventory has been tight. Yes, the supply chain tightness that we've all heard about and when supply chains are tight, inventory is tight, what happens? 
companies double order, triple order. They order more than they need. They say, hey, I'm only going to get a 50% allocation, so let me order twice as much um, right up until there's this tipping point where people don't need all the extra inventory they've ordered, and then the pendulum swings back the other way. And so we're actually seeing that now. And so that's another, you know, what I think is future driver of falling materials prices. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we think that's going to have positive impacts on inflation in the months ahead. And so from more of a macro level, just to kind of top this topic off, um, what are your 2023 predictions for the overall economy, jobs? And, you know, I know you have very in-depth knowledge about the stock market, considering your background, um, and then also just, you know, the real estate investment performances as well. Perfect. Um, you know, the economy is going to be choppy next year. The Fed has raised rates, you know, a lot. And there's a lag and a delayed impact on, on, um, on higher rates in the economy. So I think we're starting to see jobs already um, weaken, right? Facebook, Google, you know, apart from Twitter, Twitter has its own, its own drivers going on. But you know, corporations are tightening the belt. They are laying people off. Um, they are reducing headcount and trimming fat. It's not just Facebook. It's Google. It's Twitter, it's you know, it's 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 a lot of companies. Um, I think we could see more of that. Um, you know, I think we're going to see more falling prices. I do think home prices are going to be cheaper next year. Um, you know, real estate is has already come down quite a bit in price, so it's not a crash. Um, it could be more of a of a you know soft landing or modest decline. Um, but definitely it's not, you know, a growth year. It's a flat year to a slight shrinkage year at best. Got it. All right. So veering a little bit from, from the macro level, diving into more specifics on the multifamily stuff and, and topics around interest rate, how is inflation impacting renters and multifamily apartment financials and fundamentals? We'll start off with that, and then we'll 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 open that up into some other questions. Right. Well, renters are renters are stretched, and so um, they have less money to pay rent since they're spending more money on food and energy and housing and you know gas. Um, now, some of that has started to ease. Um, but you know, this year has been a a challenged year in in multifamily, if you have a lot of class A stuff with more affluent renters, you're probably in better shape. If you have a lot of class C or class D stuff with, with blue collar um, uh, type of renters, you're probably in worse shape. I mean, there has been a lot of bad debt non-collections this year. Um, you know, the, the, the free money um, assistance programs have mostly ended and the, the log jam of folks that didn't move during COVID um, has has broke and and people are moving and the courts have reopened so there is a lot of um, you know movement higher vacancy higher bad debt uh, higher expenses uh, and it's more challenged right we we you know throughout COVID in 2020 and 2021 we were celebrating we're like hey this is great this is holding up much better than we feared much better than we expected and in 22 we're sort of paying the piper um and and making up for that you know we were above trend in 2021 now we're now we're below trend in 22 working through a lot of those challenges and trying to prepare ourselves to make hay in 23 but it is look renters are stretched especially in the in the you know b minus c and d sort of sort of demographic bands and so aside from the income side, you know, on the expense side, what are some of the differences that you've noticed, you know, when, when, you know, we started to see this uptick in inflation that's affected, I guess, the bottom line, what are some of the major things that stand out? Well, payroll's definitely gone up and continues to go up. Um, 
you know, if you want good people, you have to pay them. You have to treat them well in order to retain them. It's highly competitive out there in the job market, even still. Um, definitely, you know, turnover and make ready and, and utility related expenses have gone up in an inflationary manner. Um, a little distinct from that, the insurance market for multifamily is very difficult right now. Insurance has doubled and in some cases tripled or quadrupled versus what we were paying um, just three or four years ago. You know, in some cases, hey, we paid $300 per unit per year, and now we might be paying $1,000 or $1,200 per unit per year. Um, and that's because of the, the wildfires out in the West, hurricanes, Texas freeze two years ago. Um, there's just been a lot of, of you know, casualty um, events. And, you know, that has hurt. So a lot of insurance carriers have pulled out. That's a really big one. And, you know, ultimately it's, it's you know, the tenants and residents that bear that cost. Um, you know, one other sort of comment is that municipalities know that property values have gone up and they're grabbing as much as they can while they can, you know, before the next downturn. So property taxes have gone up a lot because property valuations um, and assessments have gone up. So when we are in, in 22 being squeezed on the top line by bad debt and, and worse vacancy, and we're being, you know, squeezed on the expense side from these various factors. Um, you know, it's still a good business. We're still um, making profits, but it is, you know, it's not an easy year. So given some of those factors, how is the Avid Realty team looking at new opportunities right now? And is this a good or bad buying environment? Is this a good buying environment? Um, it is a good buying environment because prices are down somewhere between 10 and 30%. It depends on the asset, but I'd say, you know, every asset is down at least 10%. Some assets are down 20 or 30%, potentially even more. Um, so I do think it's a good buying opportunity. I also think, you know, rates are, are set to fall over the next 12 and 24 months to back to a more normalized level. And um, you know, if we can, if we can um, buy low and enjoy um, lower interest rates in the not too distant future, um, then that's then that's attractive. And and so, you know, looking to buy, how are sellers acting, and and what are you seeing from them? And is there a disconnect between buyers and sellers right now? So some sellers are, uh, if they're not distressed or they don't need to sell, they're choosing to, to, um, they're choosing to wait and enjoy better prices in a year or maybe two years. Um, some sellers do need to sell for a couple reasons. We're seeing some sellers that fall into the camp of, I have a property that has debt coming due soon. And instead of putting more cash in and doing a cash in refi and continuing to own the deal, they'd rather sell, get equity out of the deal, whether they lose money, make money, get their money out. Um, so it's either cash in refi or sell and get some or all or more than all of my money out. Um, so you've got sellers that are waiting for better prices ahead. You've got sellers that have to refi. And you do have a third bucket of sellers that have distress either at the property level, the portfolio level, um, or, or you know need cash and have to sell. And that could also be related to, to, to financing, um, potentially, it's other properties that are that, that need new loans. The proceeds are down so much that they're willing to sell this property in order to fund that property or, or in order to reduce their, their corporate level risk. Um, there are a lot of people that overpaid for assets in 20 and 21 and are upside down. 
um, and and have you know high leverage bridge loans that are that are going to come due in twenty three or twenty four. So now in the environment going after deals now, um, what type of debt is the most attractive for multifamily deals moving forward and why? We like the Freddie floater execution right now because we think rates are going to fall and we want we want rates. Uh, we want to enjoy lower rates on our on our debt. Um, I don't want to be locked into a 10 year Fannie fix to 5.7%. And 18 months from now, I can borrow again at 4.5, 4.6, 4.7. There's a large defeasance yield maintenance penalty on those Fannie fixed loans, on any fixed loan, really. Um, and so these Freddie floaters allow you to sell or refi with a, with a minimum of prepayment penalties. It allows you to float lower. Um, one thing, you know, that is a negative of the Freddie floaters is you do have to buy a rate cap. And you do have to escrow for rate cap um, replacement. However, you know the ten year has come has come down pretty meaningfully by roughly um, seventy or seventy five bips from peak levels. So the rate, the interest rate caps have gotten cheaper, and the rate cap escrows have gone down. Um, so you know I think it's kind of the best of all worlds. Now Fannie has recently introduced a Fannie five year fixed product to appeal to people that don't want to be locked in for 10 years. Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a tweener solution. Um, and that could also be worth, worth looking at, you know, but definitely leverage rates are lower, um, you know, at peak 10 year um, rates, six or eight weeks ago, leverage is, you know, 50 to 55% of purchase price. Um, and that, you know, the, the equity required to buy these deals has gone up a lot. So, um, you know, that's a little bit of the situation on the debt side right now. Yeah. And you made a lot of comment about 10 years so far. So how do 10 year treasury and so far rates impact the multifamily financing and overall deals? And, and why are they important, you know, when, when looking at that? Well, SOFR is replacing LIBOR, and SOFR is essentially the index that floating rate um, debt deals are based on, whether it's floating rate uh, agency, you know, Freddie Floaters, you know, Fannie does floaters also, um, uh, or, or bridge debts. They're, they're typically based on, on SOFR. Um, the fixed rate loans are typically based on 10-year treasury as the index of record. So that's kind of why we we live and live and breathe, um, you know, live and die by by the ten year treasury rate or or you know thirty day term SOFR. Um, one interesting thing is that you know the spread on these um, bridge debt loans is typically SOFR plus three seventy five or four hundred right now, sometimes more. So you're literally borrowing on bridge loans at eight percent, and I'm not seeing any eight cap deals out there. So any bridge debt deal is a hugely negative leverage deal. We're really shying away from them unless it's just an unbelievable home run basis deal. Um, you know, so so we're really trying to stay in the in the agency execution right now. You know, the other thing that's interesting is the the bridge debt, they say it floats. Um, it really only floats up. It really doesn't float down. They typically set a a sofa floor equal to SOFR at the time you place the loan. You can negotiate it if you're paying attention or if you shout about it. Um, but, you know, who wants to take a floater with a with a SOFR floor of 400 and you can only float up? That's a one-tailed floater. Um, we're, we're not interested in that. You know, the Freddie floaters do float up or down. There really is no floor typically. So just something to watch out for and something that I think a lot of folks that took on high leverage bridge debt deals in 20 and 21 probably didn't pay that much attention to. Um, you know, SOFR was low back then, so they didn't need to, um, but, you know, just, just something to keep in mind. So given these different scenarios, do you see any distressed deals in the marketplace right now? And will there be more distressed deals coming in 2023? We're, we're starting to see folks that have to sell because of the, the cash in refi situation that I alluded to. I think we're going to see a lot more of that in 23. You know, on the other hand, the stock market went down a lot this year. Um, Ten-year treasury and SOFR went up a lot this year. 
Uh, so there's definitely, you know, I don't know if I'd call it distress, but I'd, I'd call it commotion, um, tumult on, on, you know, relative to those factors. I don't know that we're going to see the stock market go down, you know, another 20 or 25 percent next year. So some of that is behind us. But I do think folks that have to sell because of the cash in refinance situation, um, we are going to see more more folks that have to sell because of that next year in 23. And we are going to see more sellers that have come to terms with lower price and, you know, are deciding to move on and sell for whatever reason. Um, one reason might be to go buy another deal that they like that's also a lower price deal. So if you, you know, realize less proceeds, but you're also buying a great deal at a lower price. Maybe, you know, maybe that's attractive for people. Yeah. So, so how are you making deals pencil, you know, given interest rates and, and higher cap rates? Um, in many cases, you know, I think the two terms a lot of people are mentioning is negative leverage. Um, so how is that being worked out? It's tough. There's not a lot of positive leverage deals out there. There's there's more than there were three or four months ago. Um, you know, again, as sellers sort of uh, come to terms and and, and grapple, um, you know, when we look at a deal, we don't look at one thing. We look at we look at everything. And what is everything? I mean, there's a lot of things, but we look at price per door. We look at price per foot. We look at going in cap rate. We look at, you know, post-optimized or post-value add renovated, you know, pro forma cap rate. Um, we look at how fast that particular location is growing in terms of job growth, population growth, demographics, you know, our Chick-fil-A and Panera opening up locations and, and you know, in that, um, in that area you know, is it getting better or worse? Um, so we we try to take a holistic approach, but, you know, certainly investors don't want negative leverage deals. Um, if you're borrowing on a, on a Freddie floater and the, the, the high fives right now or mid, mid fives now that the 10 year treasuries come down, you can, you know, kind of at best get a neutral leverage deal in year one. And hopefully there's value add there. Hopefully you can, um, do the value add and, and grow rents or or inflate rents, um, control costs and and you know optimize that property. Um, but it's not super easy. And buying multifamily is always thin in year one. It's always been thin in year one. It's going to continue to be thin in year one. And you have to make the asset um, perform and and grow in income. And and over time, you enjoy a wider spread but it's it is it is tight right now there's no doubt so do you believe that current spreads from treasuries to multifamily are appropriate that was a question that came from the audience the way i think about multifamily cap rates is that they generally trade 50 basis points plus or minus your cost of fanny fixed debt fanny fixed debt right now is in the mid mid to high fives um, so I generally think cap rates should trade at, um, you know, five to six and a quarter percent. But I also think that rates are going to come down over the next 12 to 24 months. And we're going to, again, be borrowing at four and three quarter percent interest rates like we were in 2015, 16, 17, 18. I don't think we're going back to covid um, level interest rates, but I do think we're going back to, you know, 2015 to 2019 um, interest rates. So, you know, if if we're borrowing from Fannie at four and three quarters a couple of years from now, which I think is very realistic in light of the um, inflation data that we just looked at, uh, it seems feasible that institutional quality multifamily assets will trade at a cap rate of four and a quarter to five and a quarter. Um, so are they, are they normal Are cap rates reasonable relative to 10 year treasury? I mean, it's, it, it kind of is what it is, right? I mean, I'm, I'll be happy to buy a, a quality asset at a five and a quarter or five and a half true cap rate. 
if I think debt is coming down into the fours, you know, over the next 24 months, I think it's, I think it's a great opportunity. So I guess that kind of funnels partly in what the answer to this question might be, but why should investors place money into multifamily deals right now, rather than investing in the stock market bonds, or, you know, I think high yield savings accounts are starting to make headway in terms of attraction as well. So, um, you know, why, why multifamily? You just teed up the softball for me, didn't you? <laughs> um, I think real estate should be a solid portion of any balanced portfolio. So I don't think you should have all of your money in real estate. I don't think you should have all of your money in the stock market. Um, a few things that I do like about real estate is it's controllable. At least I, I control my real estate. We buy value. It's an execution game. Um, we don't hope to make money on our deals. We don't um, park money in assets. We are taking a very execution focused approach to creating value. So that's one of the things that I like and why investors should invest right now. Also, prices are way down. Um, in addition, obviously, uh, real estate is very tax favored. You know, you rarely pay in, you know, income tax, even if you get cash flow distributions and down the road, your tax to capital gain tax rates instead of income tax rates. So we like the, um, you know, the tax favored nature of real estate. We like the fact that you get some cash flow along the way and future appreciation. We like that it's a hard and tangible asset that has utility for customers and residents. Um, so those are a few of the, the reasons that we like real estate. Um, I do think, you know, equities make sense as a part of a balanced portfolio. Um, the thing about equities is unless you're an active day trader, unless you're watching your stocks hour by hour, minute by minute, there's really no control. You're riding a ride. Um, you know, the stock market has averaged 7% over the long term. Um, we have achieved a 34% equity weighted average IRR on our six exited deals. I know six exited deals is not as much as a hundred years of stock market history. Um, but, you know, we like being able to control our deals. We don't think most equity managers are hedged and you're just kind of riding the ride. I do think if you want to be in equities, you should be in a balanced portfolio of iShares and ETFs that enjoy very low fees because fees are one of the great destroyers of wealth for those that invest in the stock market. Good take. Um, so you made one comment there that stood out to me, which was cash flow. How is cash flow being affected during this type of environment? I know you said it's incorporated, but how, how does that look now? Well, cash flows, <clears throat> cash flows lower. Interest rates are higher, expenses are higher, collections are worse. So cash flow is worse. Um, you know, if you're on a fanny fix from 2018, maybe interest rates aren't worse for you. If you're buying a deal now, it's definitely gonna, you know, it's gonna take, you know, a couple of years to get going. I think it's important to reiterate that multifamily investing, frankly, any investing, it's not a get rich quick scheme. Anybody who's telling you it's fast or it's easy or, you know, rat race to riches in 12 months or 24 months, um, you know, they're selling you something, right? There is no get rich. Uh, I think multifamily is get rich slowly, but predictably and with control. And, you know, that's attractive to me, but it is a slow burn, right? And you know, hopefully over time you buy a great asset at, at a reasonable price and your your mortgage and, and borrowing costs are fairly fixed and, and over time rents grow. That's just what they do. It's very rare that a landlord, you know, goes to a renter and says, hey, it's time to renew your lease. Here's how much we're lowering your, your rent this year. It just doesn't happen. I mean, you know, I'm sure I'm being probably very transparent, but that's the reality is prices go up, um, not just for rent, but for everything. Inflation happens, 
prices go up and that's why we like fixing our mortgage for a long period of time and enjoying inflating revenues and income. Um, you know, obviously one big part of the multifamily business has been refinancing and, and, and sucking out, you know, large chunks of cash every four or five, six years from, from the debt, right? Income's gone up a lot. You get, you get larger debt proceeds at a refinance. You take those enhanced proceeds, you give them back to your investors, or you go out and buy another deal and, and you repeat the process. So the cash out refi has been incredibly important to, um, you know, the multifamily return story. Um, we'll see, we'll see how that goes, you know, going forward. Um, but certainly with, with overall leverage rates of 50 to 60% now, I do think that, you know, a lot of deals with, with low leverage, um, being purchased today, we'll see positive cash out refis again in three or four years time. And this is a question that came in from the audience. Um, what are some of your favorite tertiary investment markets in the U.S. Um, during this current environment? Good question. Um, we like Texas a lot. Texas is an economic and job powerhouse. Um, there are a number of markets that are phenomenal markets that haven't gotten cheap enough yet, haven't come back down to earth. Some of those markets would be places like Phoenix, Vegas, Nashville, you know, maybe a Charlotte or a Raleigh Durham. Um, you know, and then, you know, Salt Lake City got crazy expensive in the last cycle. You know, so did Boise. Right? These are, are all, you know, the, the, the common theme here is people from California are fleeing California in search of lower cost housing, better quality of life, lower taxes. Um, and they're going to Salt Lake City, Phoenix, Vegas, Boise, you know, Denver, um, in many cases, Texas, right? So those are the markets we like. One, one market we haven't touched on in its whole, whole other world onto itself is Florida. I mean, Florida has absolutely crushed it. It's gone farther and higher than I ever imagined it would um, just post-COVID. It is slowing down. Rent growth is, is more or less stopped. I don't think prices have contracted. Um, I'm a huge believer in Florida over the long term but I really don't want to get Peloton. I don't want to buy at the peak as the inventory grows, rents decline, um, you know, vacancy gets worse and, and cap rates expand. So I'd like to buy in Orlando, Tampa, you know, St. Pete, you know, South Florida. Um, but I, I, I would rather take a wait and see approach to those markets right now, wait for the dust to settle out you know, ditto Vegas, Phoenix, Nashville, you know, maybe Austin. I mean, Austin's come down um, and we're looking at some stuff there again. Uh, but those are some of the, some of our favorite markets. There's a few markets in the Midwest that we like also. You know, Columbus has done well. Indianapolis has done pretty well. Um, you know, markets outside of DC um, have, have done really well, sort of affluent locations in in maryland um you know but we're we're looking for the best possible deal that we can find um at the best price with the best upside you know relative to demographics and location and growth and job growth and regulatory environment you know, where we're not spending a lot of time looking is new york california i don't believe in rent control i don't believe in um, a thousand pages of laws and regulations telling me what I can or can't do um, with private property. So it's just easier to buy in Texas where where the laws are simpler to understand. And, and if someone doesn't pay the rent, we can terminate that relationship within, you know, 90 or 120 days start to finish. And so outside of Texas, where the bulk of the portfolio is located, we did just enter into a new market, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. What did you see in that market? 
Well, I love that asset. That asset is probably the best location in that market. It's phenomenal dirt. Um, and I do like the market. It's it's a little bit of a sleeper market. It's below the radar. Some people won't invest in markets that are below a million, a million people. Other people, you know, it's, it's 900,000 people. Some people won't invest in markets that aren't a top 25 market. So they're also missing, you know, Raleigh, Durham or Salt Lake City or, you know, uh, maybe Austin or some others um that are that are not top 20 or 25 population markets um but some people just won't you know we like that market because there's a huge medical presence we're in the heart of the medical district we're in a live work play location um it's a sort of a very affluent resident rents are high in our location you know there's higher education in louisiana state university lsu pumping out a lot of college educated kids um, there's, uh, the state, the state capital of Louisiana is right there. It's the eighth largest port in the country. Um, and, you know, we, we think we got a good, a good price per pound on the deal and super excited to, to, to renovate that asset and make it perform. Awesome. So, so to recap here, you know, what is your overall prediction moving forward? What are some of the key things that you're going to be focusing on and, um, you know, what are the goals moving forward? Well, I think 23 is is um, it's going to be a choppy year because of the Fed higher higher federal fund rates for sure. I think you know a, a chunk of that is already discounted, but there are lagging impacts in employment and other other considerations. I do think we're going to see more distressed debt deals from folks that have to refinance or folks that overpaid. Um, uh, you know, and it's going to be a great buying opportunity because I do think in 24 months or less rates are going to be, you know, back to, to normal levels, normal being, you know, mid to upper 4% borrowing levels on Fannie debt, sort of where they were 2015 to 2019. Um, and, you know, if you can get a, a, an attractive purchase price on an asset, uh, you know, even if you have to go through a year or two of, of interest rate pain, um, it's worth it, right? The other thing is, even though we're seeing lower lower costs and materials in the near term, um, the reality is that over time costs go up. Replacement costs on these assets will continue to rise. So if you can buy a quality deal today that's five years old at, or even 10 years old at 175 a door, and five years from now, replacement cost is 300 and it's a good location with a good demographic, I think it's I think that's a smart move. Um, so we're just, you know, focused on finding the best deals we can, paying paying the most attractive prices we can for the best asset. I do think a lot of multifamily investors are gravitating more towards A and B assets, um, newer assets. I mean, I do hear folks saying we're not looking at 70s anymore. We're not even looking at 80s anymore. Um, and, you know, folks that really want a renter profile of, of, of you know, folks that can pay the rent. Um, so some folks are using this market dislocation as an opportunity to upgrade the the quality of their portfolio. Um, we're kind of doing the same thing, um, but we'll also look for super inexpensive distressed deals that, you know, three to five years from now we can sell and 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 hopefully a much higher prices. So we're just blocking and tackling and focused on execution and in this in this choppy, you know, choppy environment. Awesome. Well. This was great. Um, a lot of great knowledge and, and a lot of great questions from the audience and definitely appreciate everybody tuning in and everybody's time. And if there's any questions or, or if anybody wants to set up a one-on-one -on -one call with Craig or myself or anybody from the team, feel free to reach out and, um, and we'll, we'll continue to, to, uh, you know, spread the knowledge as, as the weeks go on. Thank you guys for joining. If anyone wants to buy deals this year, let me know. If you want to just touch base and catch up, happy to do so. Craig at avidrealtypartners.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you guys soon.